Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Bright Ideas Podcast. As always, I am your host, Trent Deersman, and I'm here to help you discover what is working in e-commerce today by shining a light on the tools, the tactics, and the strategies in use by today's most successful e-commerce entrepreneurs. On the show with me today is a fellow by the name of Stefan Arstol. Uh, Stefan is the founder of Tower Paddleboards, a company that was founded in 2010 and funded by the billionaire Mark Cuban. Tower Paddleboards is one of the biggest success stories in Shark Tank history. With only $100,000 in sales at the time of the pitch in 2011, Cuban invested just $150,000. And since then, Tower has gone on to do over $36 million in sales, landing it at the coveted slot of number 239 on the 2015 Inc. 500 list. So we're going to welcome Stefan here in just a second. But first, today's episode is brought to you by My FBA Prep. Are you an Amazon seller? Tired of prepping your products at home or the headache of running your own warehouse? My FBA Prep is a network of commercial prep centers with locations in every region of the country for Amazon sellers like you. They'll save you time and money when you ship into them and you will be working with real people who have experience inside of Seller Central. Check out Preptopia, their proprietary order tracking platform, so you know where your inventory is and when it's been sent into Amazon's Fulfillment Center. My FBA, my FBA Prep provides prep, logistics, and fulfillment services for all types of e-commerce sellers. Go to myfbaprep.com to sign up or get a custom quote for any of your prep or fulfillment needs. And when you do, use coupon code BRIGHTIDEAS to save $30 off your first month's subscription. So, Stefan, thank you so much for coming and being a guest on the show. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Trent. I appreciate it. So, what made you uh, come up with the idea for Tower Paddleboards? Were you uh, a paddleboard aficionado? Well, not, not really. I, uh, I've set, had an online business selling poker chips, well, fivepokerchips.com, that I'd had since about 2003. And I'd been in the inter internet space since 1999. And um, the, paddle, or the uh, poker chip company was sort of winding down. There was a big peak, and then it sort of fell off. And so I was looking for a replacement. And a, a buddy took me out paddleboarding. And mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was quite fun, a lot easier than surfing. And mm -hmm. so I... I went to buy one and it was just super expensive. It was like 1200 bucks for this large surfboard. Was, yeah. It doesn't make sense. So I, I said, well, maybe I'll, you know, produce these and sell them for half price and do a direct to consumer. And uh, so I looked at the search statistics of it and this industry was growing hundred percent a year and it was just exploding. That was in 2010 when I started the Paddle Wars. Okay. So you went from selling something really small and thought, Hey, I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum and sell something really, really big on the internet. Yeah. Did funny. you know anything? <laughs> did you know anything about making paddle boards? Uh, no, no. And that actually, in my opinion, is benefit. I knew nothing about making poker chips when I started that too. <laughs> I poker, but I wasn't a great poker player by any means, but I understood it enough that I, I felt I understood poker players and I could, uh, you know, make a business out of it. And with, Paddle boards, um, actually being an outsider was an advantage in that industry um, because everybody, you know, was sort of doing groupthink and they were all acting the same. Mm -hmm. And every uh, company, a lot of the people were coming from surfing or they're coming from windsurfing and they were going after the sexy markets, which was surfing and racing. And really those sexy markets accounted for about maybe 10% of the entire mm -hmm. market. There was this mid market that was being ignored. And we said, we're just going to make products for this mid market. Um, you know, give them a good product. And then also um, a couple of years in, just like you said, you know, poker chips are a great e-commerce product because it's very easy to ship. A paddleboard is like, you know, 12 feet long, three feet wide. It has to be on a, a truck, right? 20% mm -hmm. of these are getting damaged. It was a nightmare e-commerce business, but there were these inflatable paddleboards. And so, I mean, I really wanted the inflatable paddleboard to work because it just worked better for this, you know, mail order business that we oh, had. Yeah. And so we, uh, we basically started experimenting with inflatable paddle boards. And at the time, they were 1% of the market. And so we made a paddle board that they used to be four inches thick, which everybody in the industry thought was just stupid thick, right? Because mm -hmm. boards are like, you know, two and a half inches thick. Mm -hmm. and we made one six inches thick and one eight inches thick because we felt like the thicker it is, I mean, it's just sort of, you know, physics, the more rigid it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And basically fixed the inflatable paddle board. And it, instead of it being 
like uh, going like a banana through the water. It was super rigid, mm -hmm. um, going thicker. And today the inflatable market is about 70% of the market. I mean, and that was in a period of four years, it went from 1% to 70% and we sort of led that charge. And that's precisely because we knew nothing about paddle boarding, <laughs> you know, when we started this and we were just yeah. completely a uh, blank slate. Yeah, so you went at it from a, a different perspective, thinking, well, I have this logistical problem to solve and that I wanna make something that's easy to ship. I don't know how to make paddle boards the way they're made now, so what else could we come up with? Now, now did you pioneer the idea of inflatable paddle boards or was that already around and a very small thing? It, it was around for probably five or seven years, but nobody in the industry took them seriously. They didn't like them. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't a real paddle board. And you still get people today that's like, oh, an inflatable's not gonna work, but you'd be amazed. I mean, you put this thing over a 10 foot span and a 200 pound guy can step on it and it barely flexes. So um, we like took another look at it and we basically just tweaked the design of them and improved it. And then everybody has followed essentially. Okay. So the level of competition in the niche when you got into it, you'd mentioned that there was these incumbent players that were in the industry and they were the surfers and the windsurfer people. And, and how, how much competition were they for you in the segment that you, that you were going to go after? And was that segment, did it change? Like when you launched the company, did you already know you were going to go after this middle market or did you sort of stumble your way there through errors in pursuing the, the hardcore market to begin with? No, I mean, we initially, I sold other people's products because I was testing demand and I didn't want to go into production. And my other business was dying. I was literally job hunting while I was starting this business. And nobody yeah. would hire me because I was an entrepreneur. Um, but, uh, you know, we definitely knew we wanted to go into that mid-market. Um, yeah, what, what was the other, rest of the question? Give that to me one more time. Um, how much competition, so I'm trying to get a feel for how much competition was there. Because a lot of, the reason for this question is this. Many first time entrepreneurs, they look at a market and they see incumbents and they think, oh, there's too much competition. So they don't enter the, enter the market. And many times maybe miss out on a tremendous opportunity because they make that wrong assumption about competition. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, yeah, there were probably 80 brands that were selling paddle boards. I mean, it was a crowded market at the time and we were fairly early into it. Um, and there were companies that were already doing, you know, 10 million a, a year in sales um, in paddle boards. Um, but most of them were selling at the time in 2010, most of them were selling through, they were trying to get the three or four coveted spots in retail stores and were, you know, selling through small surf shops. And this, so they were all using the same business model. We were going mm -hmm. direct to consumer at the time. There was maybe only one of two of those companies were employing a direct to consumer strategy, but, uh, they were sort of doing a bastardized version where they were doing direct to consumer, but they really wanted to be in the retail stores. So they were sort of doing both of that and also mm -hmm. selling on eBay and a very confused distribution strategy. We, we went just pure direct to consumer. If you fast forward to today, there's probably 150 brands in the paddleboard uh, market. So there's more competition. But my personal perspective is, all, every business that I've ever done that's been successful is basically, we've identified demand, and I found a way to uh, put us, build a good brand within that demand. If there's no competition, you don't necessarily know if there's demand. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah absolutely. You know, our business now, we've expanded into other beach lifestyle products and the latest uh, company we launched about a year ago is Tower Electric Bikes. And if you wanna talk about a crowded industry, <laughs> I mean, there's probably 500 brands of electric bikes out there. And in the last 15 years, there's companies that have invested $100 million and gone bankrupt in e-bikes. Um, mm -hmm. But there's definitely demand and it's growing, uh, you know, significantly. So we think we're gonna make, you know, with Mark Cuban, we're gonna do the billionaire bike and e-bike and we're going to uh, we're going to take over this industry so let's go down that rabbit hole a little bit if we may and you can use either the bikes or the boards to answer the questions i'm really not too concerned but where i want to fill in the gaps is for entrepreneurs who are at that and that inflection point of you know do i move forward or do i go back to my drawing board because if i move forward i have to invest capital and i have to invest time and therefore there's the risk of failure and all the things that people are always trying to avoid kind of help me get inside your head when you were doing that research so that 
we have a greater understanding of what was it that enabled you, because now you're a little bit more experienced, but so maybe let's go back to, you know, with the boards when you were a little less experienced and maybe not as high a level of confidence and you didn't have the backing of Mark Cuban, of course. What was it that allowed you to think, yeah, I, I need to move forward with this? Well, I think at the time it was, I mean, people were selling ex- paddle boards through uh, the regular distribution channel and it was broken. Like why does something that costs, you know, 250 or $300 to produce sell for 12 to $1,600? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not because we haven't found a cheap enough way to manufacture. We certainly mm-hmm. have, but distribution uh, models and retail are just broken. That's why the entire retail industry is going out of business. Now Amazon is sort of, you know, taking over. Um, mm-hmm. So, that's the simple problem we were solving. It had nothing really to do with paddle boards. It had to do with fixing broken distribution systems. I've, I've started another company called nomiddleman.com, which yep. basically aggregates the top, you know, three or 400 um, direct to consumer brands that operate in every little niche. This is sort of a movement that is, that is taking over. That's the problem we fix in paddle boards. We, although we did modify the inflatable paddle board, we didn't really come in with any huge, you know, innovative new paddle board stuff. Um, yep. It's really our business model. Okay. So Shark Tank came along, you had $100,000, I think, in total sales by the time you got on Shark Tank. So, so how long did it take you to get the $100,000, first of all, in sales? That was probably over about six months, but it was ramping up fast. I think in the month before Shark Tank, we did 35000 of that. So um, okay. it, was, it was ramping up and it was sort of already taking off. And, you know, in our run up to um, you know, the show airing or the pitch, um, you know, we were, we didn't even have paddle boards like in stock yet. We were basically selling, pre-selling a container of paddle boards. Um, you know, so it was a different, uh, sort of sales experience once we had boards landed on the ground and we could ship them out immediately. Okay. So now you've applied to Shark Tank, you've got accepted to be one of the pitchers, uh, and you have this opportunity to get up and stand in front of the billionaires. What was some of the legwork you did to make sure that you were ready for that? And then, um, well, let's let's deal with that one first. Yeah. So uh, first, we didn't get uh, we didn't apply to be on Shark Tank. So I just you know while I was running this business, I had just hired my first employee about three weeks earlier, and um, we just got a call one day out of the blue. And it was this guy saying, "Hey, um, you know, really? <laughs> we've got this TV show. We'd like you to be on." And, you know, I get calls like this quite a bit, even with the poker chip company, the poker chip company was on TV, but because it was a hot trending industry and paddle boards was a hot trending industry, we get a lot of media calling and saying, we want you to be on our show. And then you talk to them for an hour. And at the end they say, and oh, by the way, there's a $19,000 production. Yeah. And so every entrepreneur has got this call. And so I just get tired of that. So I was, you know, sort of hostile towards this guy. And I said, um, yeah, you know, it just, so we're up front here. I'm not interested in paying to be on your show or whatever. And he's like, no, 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 And I'm like, well, I've never heard of this show, Shark Tank. What is this? Because it was season two. This was very uh, early. Okay. Show. And they said, well, it's on ABC on Friday night. And I'm like, what are you talking about? How do I not even know about this show that's about entrepreneurs raising capital on prime time on ABC? Yes, I'll be on your show. And I was pitching five weeks later. Um, so there wasn't a lot of preparation. I was literally in the hotel you know, the night before we were sort of sequestered for four days up there, um, you know, trying to memorize my pitch and trying to mm-hmm. memorize the name of all, you know, five of the sharks too, because mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I feared going on there and calling somebody by the wrong name. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> and I ended up screwing up my pitch, uh, sort of my memorized pitch. I have a horrible memory and I'm known as the worst pitch in the history of shark tank that still landed a deal. Cause I went in there, I froze, I got called a nerd. I got called a leprechaun. I got he told this is the worst day of my life, and <laughs> set it out and come back and uh, end up getting a deal uh, with Cuban. What was it? Because I'm sure you, you must have asked Mark this after the fact. You know, in in spite of your um, less than Academy Award winning performance, what was it about your pitch that caught Mark's attention? Was it that he was super enamored with the product? Or was he just super enamored with you or some combination of both? Well, when the deal was actually, he got uh, 30% of tower paddle boards for $150,000 plus first ride refusal to invest in any business I raise money for in the future. And this was in Shark Tank history. 
where there was this sort of little flyer on any future businesses. And they didn't like the paddle boards. None of them did. I mean, three of them were out right away. Of course, I made an idiot out of myself. Uh, but they're just like, there's 80 brands in this. Like, what are you going to add? You've got no intellectual property. Yeah. Don't be an idiot. You'll never do anything here. And so they thought that the, the paddle boards was just a stupid idea. So I essentially, in the middle of the pitch, I just pivoted. And I started pitching them the idea of a business flipping service. I would use my SEO skills to, we would go, I said, it's really hard to take a, a business from zero to a million dollars in sales, but it's really easy to take a business from 10 million to 20 million in sales. So we'll use your guys' war chests of cash. We'll buy a business uh, for 10 million. We'll inject what I know and we'll sell it a year later for uh, 20 million. And I said, that's the way to make easy money. And, you know, most of the are just sort of confused, but Cuban and uh, Mr. Wonderful were like, this is great. Like, I would love this. I could just inject this into my existing businesses. And so yeah. then this bidding war. But, you know, I was on recorded for probably an hour um, and they had to they had to cut this episode so it made sense to viewers. So most of that got cut out of there. Uh, was, okay. This guy making an idiot out of himself. And then all of a sudden, Mark Cuban offers him a deal and wants his future companies. So it didn't make a lot of sense um, the way it was cut, but it made for good TV because it was this sort of rocky like comeback, it looked like. Yeah. So he did invest in the paddleboard company, but did you ever go and do the flipping thing in addition to that? No, we've done other businesses though. Like now we've got the, um, you know, we started the owner of the e bike business. Um, we've got uh, Tower Beach Clubs, which is like an event space as we do pop up retail within it. Um, and then the No Middleman. So he's, he's in other companies, um, you know, and hasn't had to put any more money in. So that's, it's worked out good for him. But we haven't done the, the business flipping idea. Um, another thing is that, I mean, the world has really changed since 2010. And since I got yeah. to the internet space, since, you know, my poker chip company was started in 2003. Um, I mean, it's dramatically changed. I mean, the opportunities are, are much different today than they were, you know, a while ago. Like Amazon, like the, the opportunity to sell on Amazon is almost like a window that is closed to profit yeah. make money on Amazon as a, you know, third party vendor. I mean, Amazon has just sucked all the profit out of that. Um, mm -hmm. They're taking half of, you know, search, original product search from Google. And so mm -hmm. Google is sort of trying to hang on to stuff. So they're throwing more ads in and more Google products. So the, it's almost like organic search listings are disappearing from the internet. And, you know, Google takes half of everything that's sold on, on search. Amazon takes half of everything, you know, else. And everybody else is dying. I mean, mm -hmm. it was hardcore retail. But I think there's sort of a, a reckoning coming with uh, the ability to sell anything, really. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by reckoning? Talk me into that. Well, we've got such a concentration of power between Amazon and Google that mm -hmm. they're basically sucking the profit out of everything. Mm -hmm. So if you have 80, you know, paddleboard brands and the only way they can sell is, you know, through Amazon or through uh, paid search, um, it's, it's just a, it's just a fight to the bottom. Yep. And, and, but Google and Amazon are taking, you know, 50% revenue. If I sell a paddleboard today on Amazon, for six hundred dollars, Amazon will take two hundred dollars. You know, mm -hmm. I'll keep yeah. one hundred fifty to make. I'll keep one hundred and fifty. And those economics are getting worse every year and every month, really. Yeah. Uh, and, and that isn't even the metrics anymore. And Amazon, Amazon will take three hundred today. Uh, but and then if I sell it on Google using you know AdWords or something like that, six hundred AdWords, Google will take two hundred. I'll get one hundred and fifty. Give the manufacturer two hundred and fifty. Those metrics are getting worse. So the only one who's going to survive long term is these uh, these monopolies. This is really what the my no middleman uh, you know dot com business was about. Is you have to basically band together with other sellers of direct to consumer products because that may be the only uh, future way to sell products. In my opinion, interesting perspective. Um, what was it like working with Mark Cuban as an investor of yours? It's been, it's been good. I mean, and it's, he's kind of a mentor in a sense too. And I didn't really realize that I would have direct access to him. Um, like negotiating the deal uh, prior to sort of, you know, signing on, I was just dealing with his, his lawyers. Um, yep. And then once the deal was signed, they're like, okay, CC marked on everything. And I think the first or second email I sent, you know, he was, you know, swearing back at me, don't be an idiot, don't do this. <laughs> so it was really CCing the rest of the team. And he was, he was going to chime in on everything. So I was like, mm -hmm. well, 
at least, you know, I'm, I'm getting, you know, visibility here, but I've, I've learned a lot from him. Um, you know, and I don't think he entirely trusted me, you know, the first year I sort of had mm -hmm. to build this level of trust. And once I built that, um, you know, it's, it's been a very valuable situation. He doesn't always tell me what I want to hear. And so I've learned, I don't ask unless I really uh, value or am concerned with his opinion. And then I'll use that to base my decision because I can't ask. And then he says, do this. And then I say, nope, I'm doing this. Yeah. So if I just want to do it, I do it and I inform him. And if I really am like, I don't know, let's go with what you want. What do you think? Um, so you, you got to learn how to deal with somebody like that. Cause it's a, it's a total, not balance of power, right? Mm -hmm. Even though I have a majority stake in the company, you know, he's in a much more powerful position to help me with other businesses in the future, you know, especially because we have that sort of side deal where he's got sort of a first right of refusal on investing in any business. Now, what if you are starting a business, but you're not raising any money? Does this first right of refusal still give him the opportunity to buy in? It, it doesn't. It's only if I raise money, okay. but um, the no middleman, uh, company. I sort of did that on the side for about a year and I was going to go pitch it on Shark Tank and the producers were like, yeah, this sounds cool. Uh, you know, we'll have you come pitch it. Um, but Mark can't know anything about it. So I kind of had to do it in secret on the side. Right. <laughs> and then I got to the point of where I had to create the LLC and I was talking to my lawyer and he's like, you can't go pop this on your business partner. You've been doing a side project for a year and uh, pop it on national. This is not going to go well. So I had to sort of tell him. And when I told him, I said, realize I have an employment contract with you, but this was all done on the weekends, evenings, you know, my own money. And I said, but you know, which way do you want this? Here, I'll, I'll do it on my own and I'll give you, if you want to invest a million bucks, I'll give you a you know, preferable, you know, deal. And then we'll go raise money somewhere else. Or we'll just use that money. Or if you feel that this is, you know, rightfully yours, then, you know, you can have 30% and we'll go on. Um, I sent him that email with, you know, a 30 page business plan and spent four hours writing this email. He replied in like nine minutes on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> and said, I love the idea. Uh, it's definitely got to be under tower. That would create all kinds of problems if we don't do that. And we need to tweak the, uh, the model here and we need to have a bidding structure. <laughs> so he basically processed this, analyzed this, made a recommendation for this <laughs> in nine minutes. <laughs> that's, that's how you become a billionaire, I guess, on a Saturday. Right. Yeah, that, that would be why he's a billionaire and, uh, and I'm not. <laughs> All right. So if you were to, uh, cause I know what my audience is going to be asking about Mark. So you learned a lot of things from him. Let's, let's satiate them with one more thing about Mark. Um, what would you say is the greatest lesson that you, uh, that you learned from working with Mark? Yeah, I think protect your downside. I mean, if you look at Mark, how Mark made his money, it's almost like he's a little paranoid. Like he, he basically got out of the internet bubble before the, the bubble burst. Which did he ever? Rare. I mean, you could probably count on one finger the number of people that did that in a major way. And, yeah. he did. and so when, um, you know, we started Tower, it was like we were growing so fast. We weren't advertising for the first four years and we were just growing. We never had anything in stock. It would be June 1st. We're a water sports company and we don't have our most popular product in stock for six weeks. And I was just like, Mark, this is it's it's consuming a lot of capital because I gotta buy this stuff, I gotta pay three months ahead of time. I mean, like, I can't keep stuff in stock. Why don't you just give me a million dollar line of credit and we'll blow this thing up to 10 million right away. And he would just ignore those emails. And he, and you know, I, I kept telling him, hey, I've got cash flow. And he's like, look kid, like everybody has cash flow problems, deal with it. And, <laughs> and I'm like, but I'm leaving upside on the table. And he's like, quit worrying about your upside. He's like, worry about your downside, worry about going to zero. And I thought, you know, it was real money to me already, but for him, this seemed like insignificant money that he could have just threw fuel on the fire and made a much bigger yeah. return for him. But he's very, I would say almost tight, like conservative. It doesn't even make sense to me. Um, but now that we've sort of peaked and come back down, um, it's made a lot more sense. Like we're much more protected as this, this uh, industry is, is going in a downward cycle and mm -hmm. you know, more competition, Amazon taking over half the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that protecting your downside, it seems really stupid, but uh, that's something that I've really, uh, you know, learned and taken away. And I think that will serve me well in the future. I would agree based upon my own several decades of being an entrepreneur. Uh, that is a lesson I, I took a long time to learn um, <laughs> and have found now finally learned it. And, and now when we have big wins, I'm not in a big hurry to spend all the money. 
because I like to protect my downside. I like to be very flush and have as much liquidity as possible because you just cannot predict, uh, you know, a year and a half ago in one of my businesses, we lost three of our key product lines and revenue went down 70% in a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> and that was, and that was after growing at 20% per quarter for eight consecutive quarters. So, you know, we're on fire. And then all of a sudden we just got our head chopped off. And that is happening more and more today because the business cycles are faster. I mean, yeah. I, I speak at Harvard, you know, probably once a year. And, you know, I, I'm telling these kids like how fast the cycle is going now. Like it used to be a company would be on like the, uh, what's the, the S&P 500. Yep. Like companies used to be on that for like, you know, forever years, right? Today, yep. they're on there for 16 years. In 10 years, it's going to be like five years. That's on the S&P 500. That's these big companies. So yeah. small companies are just coming and going and coming and going. It's so fast. Um, you, you, can't, uh, you can't rest on your laurels at all. No, you cannot. All right. So I discovered you originally uh, because of this five-hour workday thing. And I had read an article that wasn't about you, about some company that had adopted this five-hour workday. And I thought, well, that's fine for them, but they don't have any history with it yet. So I don't know if it worked. So I started Googling around and I found an article about you. And I think you did this with Tower, if memory serves me correctly. And, you know, it was back in 2011 or 12 or something. You can correct me. But I thought, well, I want to reach out to this guy and see if this five-hour workday thing actually worked out now that a number of years have gone by since the article is published. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. Tell me about you know, when did you do it? What company was it? Why did you do it? And yeah. so forth. It was in 2015 and it was with tower paddle boards. And, you know, today we're credited with basically inventing five hour workday. Um, you know, and I initially did it as a three month test. Um, basically it's kind of how I've been working for the last 10 or 15 years. And a lot of my entrepreneurial peers that were doing well, were working sort of these compressed days. You come in head down, get your work done. And so I thought, well, let's roll that out to an entire company. How would that work? So it was basically sort of a test we were doing and it wasn't just a test. Um, you know, part of it was socialistic, like I wanted to, we were doing well, we were just, you know, named the fastest growing company in San Diego. And I was like, hey, we've proven we can be successful, but we're this beach lifestyle company that's working like a startup. Let's live our brand. Uh, mm -hmm. So that would really be the intent of it. We're going to do a three month test and see how this goes. Um, and it worked so well that we just kept doing it. We did it full time for two years. And today we do it in the, in the summer months. Uh, there were some issues with it. Um, but, you know, productivity was not one of them because there's a lot of waste in, in, in the workday. And, you know, what we found is if you just compress it, people just sort of figure out how to, how to work a little faster. Um, so let, let's, let's dive down in that rabbit hole for a minute. You said you didn't lose productivity. What, walk me through when you rolled this out to your team, walk me through, um, you know, what you said to them and the changes they needed to make so that they could get eight hours worth of work done in five hours. Yeah. I gave them no instructions. I basically said, I'm going to give you your life back. We're going to work 8 a.m. 1 a.m. straight through. We're getting rid of lunch. Um, that's going to cut out a lot of waste. So yeah. before we were working, you know, roughly a nine to five job, which yeah. sounds like eight hours, but you have an hour yeah. lunch in there. That's really <laughs> a seven hour day. Yeah. Um, so you're really only cutting out two hours. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was it. And the other thing was after you go to lunch, you know, if you have a heavy, you know, American lunch, you're dead for like an hour, right? Food coma. Yep. Coma. And that's, and, and there's, there's actually, you can trace like people's you know, power levels or sort of how they can pay attention. And you really can't do much in the two to three, especially right after you've eaten. So I didn't think it was much of a cut at all, but I said, okay, I'm going to give you your life back. You're literally going to walk out the door at 1 PM. So every day during the week, you're going to have one till, you know, 10 or 11 or whenever you go to bed. And then you're going to have your weekends. You're going to have a work week that's better than most people's vacation weeks. Mm -hmm. um, that's the give. The ask is that you've got to figure out how to be as productive or more productive. And if you can't figure that out, I'm going to fire you. And I'm going to find people to, who can do that. Because this was really a recruitment and retention strategy. Mm -hmm. We wanted to get all the people you know, that are in an office that work at three times the speed of everybody else. If you go into any office in America, there's a small group of people who are really hardcore performers. And then there's, you know, the masses. And I just wanted a company of just those people. 
and that's really what we wanted to do. And this was um, about, about a year into this experiment. I mean, it was working so well and I was writing articles about it and they were getting a lot of press. So, and this was, we really, we were living our brand. So I wrote a book and the idea was we're gonna put a book in every paddleboard that we ship out. We'll get, you know, 10 or 15,000 of these out there and people will, you know, learn about our company by this brand. That book ended up getting press in about 20 countries. What you probably read this article in the Wall Street Journal about a German company. Um, it's spread yep. around the world to, you know, over 10 million people. Um, there was a, like a Huffington Post video that got four and a half million views. Uh, so people have really, they understand the concept that we're wasting a lot of time at work. And uh, this was sort of a model to compress that. And it's just like finals week in college. You compress it and you put pressure on people and they just figure out the ways. So, but there was no rules, you know, that I said, well, you gotta do this and this and this. <laughs> you're each gonna become your own efficiency experts. And if you can't figure it out, you're gonna be fired. So the article that was published more recently, I think one of the tricks that they used was everyone put their cell phone in their backpack, you know, in the, in the wherever. So nobody is, you know, on social media during the day, nobody's texting during the day because you know, that the, the cell phone is a huge, big time pig, probably much more so now than it bet was back in well, 2015, I guess it wasn't that much different. So did you implement anything like that to help, put guardrails on your policy? We didn't. And, you know, I don't, I don't know how realistic that, that is, to be perfectly honest. There's, there's a German company that is doing this now. That was who was in the Wall Street Journal, and they were in the New York Times. And they, I mean, they've done like a media tour on this, right? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of that may be BS, to be perfectly honest. Um, you could implement rules, but I don't think people will even obey those in, in today's world. We're just too connected, right? Like, you know, say you got kids in school, you can't have your phone in your backpack yeah, and not do it during work hours. That's, that's not a, that sounds like something that you might do, but that's not realistic. <laughs> it's not gonna work. Um, you have to, um, you have to identify productivity tools is the idea. So things like, uh, you know, there's a little application you can get for your phone that will, uh, you know, like cut it off or you can't get access to social media. So you can do those to yourself. And I think things like that, the technology that will help you focus um, will definitely help. And, you know, we spread those around because everybody in our team was identifying productivity hacks and somebody would find one and then they would pass it to everybody. Like when we started this, I was using a, you know, a Word document for my passwords and somebody introduced me on the team, introduced me to LastPass. And I mean, this thing has saved me like so much time. It's, it's unbelievable. It probably saves me an hour a week. It's just sort of a password storage and, and retrieval. It makes you much more secure. Something that's been around for 10 years and I'm not using it. You know, a lot of these tools that we've identified, I've introduced to other companies, it's tools that have been around for 10 years and people are not using them and they're free. Yeah. Okay. So you created a culture of productivity hackers where everybody knew that, hey, collectively, if we all help, we're all going to be better off and not get fired and still have our five hour work day. So and it's a renegotiation with labor. Like there's something very tangible about walking out the door at 1 p.m. It, it basically gives you the experience of being an entrepreneur, right? You yeah. have this extraordinary life and work is just something you do, you know, before noon to afford this. So there's something, it's not just telling people to work harder and figure out how to work faster. They have this tangible give. It's like, holy cow, this is a great lifestyle. I don't want to lose this. I'm going to buckle down at work, you know? And when you, when you only have five hours to do stuff, you find that you can't waste a lot of time. There is pressure. So why did you then make the shift from being five hour days all year to only five hour days in the summertime? Two, two things happened. One, uh, the paddleboard business uh, got more difficult. We started to drop in revenues. And this was just a test. I wasn't going to live or die by the five hour workday. So I said, well, maybe we need to buckle down and work a little harder here. Uh, but, um, you know, I had this highly productive group and I figured we could get twice as much done if we, you know, work 10 hours. But um, more importantly, it, the, the part of it that I thought would work that was not working was recruitment and retention. Uh, I had a team of nine at the time and I had lost um, four of them in the prior 90 days. And I mean, these were people that were making, you know, $70,000 a year, had a five hour work day and they were in their young 20s, right? And people were leaving the company. This doesn't make any sense to me, right? I fired one of the guys, but the other three left. Uh, one, you know, went in a van with her boyfriend around the country. Another one moved to Mexico. Another one went into uh, 
you know, a, a marketing agency or something like that. And so I'm losing good people. And I'm thinking like either they don't appreciate the five hour workday or it's not really achieving what it was, what it was meant to achieve. So if I'm not getting that benefit, why do I really have that? And that was, I was sort of angry at first, but then when I really looked back on it a few months later, what happened is we, we lost our company culture as a startup. Like, cause when you're in a startup and you're working these long hours, you're basically in the trenches with everybody. You form these really strong bonds mm -hmm. and it's hard to leave those. Right. Mm -hmm. And we destroyed that when, we, when everybody's walking out at work at one o'clock, the rest of your life becomes much bigger and mm -hmm. your life becomes very small. So we didn't have those strong bonds. So when we tweaked the experiment, what we did is we kept the five hour days during the summer. So for four months, and that is the busiest four months for us. That's when we do 70% of our revenue. So we're squeezing people for time during the busy season. So we still get the productivity hacks and every year we'll identify new sort of productivity hacks or way to do what we're doing better. And then in the off season, we go to a startup work culture where we work these projects and we work long hours in the trenches together. And so I think that gives us the benefits of both. Um, that's where we're at right now. I've thought of doing, um, you know, kind of a 10 year thing. So maybe after you've been in the company four or five years, then you go to a full time uh, five, five hour day. Because the other element was, I think some people are not ready for this. Like when we rolled it out to the whole company, everybody had kind of earned it, the five-hour workday, right? Yeah. But we started to hire new people in. And these people were just gifted a five-hour work. And it didn't, it worked differently for those people. And we brought in some people and they just worked like an old eight-hour day over five, five days and didn't get a whole bunch done. So I think it would be a disaster if you like, you know, the U.S. economy just said, okay, we're moving everybody to a five-hour workday. I think it's going to happen very organically. I don't think people are ready for it. Okay. You just turned your camera off by accident, by the way. Oh. We're conked out. So let's, uh, let's finish up then with, for anyone who's considering it, are there some pearls of wisdom that you would like to offer? Yeah, so I, I would say to check out the book. Uh, it's Five Hour Workday. Uh, you get it on Amazon or fivehourworkday.com. Um, but the, you know, the, the wisdom is here. Any company can benefit from a three-month test. Because basically, and with the telling everybody, you're going back to a regular workday. So don't get used to this. This isn't going to be a full-time thing. But I'm going to give you the summer off. So mm -hmm. enjoy the summer. We're going to walk out the door at 1 o'clock. and you know, give them the same thing. I'm giving your life back for the summer. You've got to figure out how to, how to do your job faster. And if you don't, you'll be fired. And there has to be really real teeth to this. And so what you're going to do is you're going to force everybody to examine how they're working and figure out productivity hacks and share those productivity hacks with their neighbors. And then when you go back to the eight hour day or 10 hour day or whatever it is, you'll have a workforce that can do twice the work. Yeah. What company would want to do that? Is that not worth a three month test? and giving your employees this sort of like great summer, you know, vacation. Mm -hmm. um, I think that'll work for any company. And a lot of people say, well, this works great for, you know, you guys are an internet, uh, you know, business, you're all marketing guys. We did this in our retail store. Uh, we changed customer service hours. We only answered the phone for five hours. Our warehouse went to five hours. Um, you know, in the warehouse, for example, it used to take them about five minutes per package, you know, shipping and doing everything, the processing. By the, you know, within, I think, like two months, uh, that was down to 2.6 minutes. We didn't bring in the expert. They just figured out how to use the software that they already had on their computers, figured out how to use it better. They redesigned stuff, and they just figured out how to do stuff faster. And why hadn't they done that for the, you know, the three or four years before? They weren't forced to. That's what the American work is today. People are just throwing, you know, time at stuff, and productivity is up a thousand percent in the last 30 years. But Productivity in America is up 80% from 30 years ago when, you know, my mom was working in a bank with a typewriter, you know, writing out letters and mailing them to people as a way to communicate. And she has a phone that's tied into the wall. She doesn't even have a computer on her desk. And you're telling me the workforce is only 80% more productive today? That's insanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no kidding. If the internet goes out, what do you do? We just go home. It's pointless to even be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very true. All right, last question for today. What is your best advice for today's entrepreneurs who are interested in building a direct-to-consumer business? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, that no middleman, uh, com site that I, I put out there, we have 3,000 categories and probably 1,500 of them are empty. Um, so there's a lot of uh, categories that there is no direct-to-consumer brand attacking that category. 
and there's a lot that there's only one or two and then there's like mattresses and there's like a hundred companies you know going after that i think it can be done in any um category um so i mean that's pick pick a product uh, pick a good category and and go direct to consumer and you know keep your costs low because that's the thing the, unless you're willing to in today's environment you know raise a hundred million dollars and give half of that money to you know google adwords and then you know take a loss on all of your amazon sales for five years to build your brand it's difficult to start a brand today it's not like it was you know five or seven years ago or you know, 15 years ago for sure um, so what you have to do is you have to keep your day job and do this as a side gig and keep your 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 burn rate extremely low grow it organically until it gets sort of legs of, it, of its own. Because uh, the, the environment is getting a lot harder. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm an optimistic person, but part of me thinks that maybe the window of opportunity of making and selling stuff is, is past. I mean, everything's gonna be private label, you know, Amazon Basics or their other 120, um, you know, brands. And it may be that we're in, a, we're in an environment now where, uh, there's such concentrations of power and such strong monopolies that these there will be you know four or five companies that just sort of make everything and control everything. I mean, I think we're in a very dangerous uh, position. It's like we're we're in the 1920s again, and I think we need to basically break up these monopolies, or there's going to be some really really bad outcomes. Interesting perspectives and lots to think about. And I definitely can find some areas of what you said that I agree with and some areas that I don't. And that is what encourages thought. So thank you so much, Stefan, for making some time to come be on the podcast. Um, you'll get an email afterwards asking for links to the things that you talked about. So I can put all of those in the show notes. So please make sure that you reply to that. So for anyone who wants to uh, learn more about you or contact you via LinkedIn or whatever, they'll, uh, they'll have links in the podcast or in the post rather to be able to do that. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me on, Trent. I appreciate it.